Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Disco Elysium with me, Bring It On. Now let's finish checking these traps. A familiar apparatus lies among the reeds. Another one of Morel's traps, weighed down by stones to keep it in place. Look around. The reeds shake sadly in the coastal breeze. Snow specks the stalks. Most of it melts quickly, relinquishing form to darkness. The wind picks up here, near the cape's end, surrounding the narrow strip of land from three cardinal directions. It's cold for this time of year. Reach for the trap. This trap is also full of panicked locusts. No sign of any cryptozoological beast inside. Another empty trap. Lieutenant takes a note, more out of habit than duty. Well, let's keep going. The next one is the lucky one. Yep. The next one has a crab trapped in it. These are just crab traps, you do realize? He raises his collar. It's windy. Alright, let's check the one over there next to the water lock. And then back to the one that Morel was laying when we spoke to him. And then we'll return to the whirling, speak to Morel, Lena, and Gary. And then we'll be all prepped to do the church next. And then at 10 p.m. we have to go meet... Not this way. Uh, that woman on the boardwalk. Get our gun back, hopefully. This trap's not too hard to spot, once you know what to look for. Keeping it hidden has not been a priority for the cryptozoologist. Look around. The reeds bend forlornly toward the sand. Some tufts have been crushed. The broken stalks seem like a rebuke. The sound of the city hums in the east. The constant, distant song. Louder on this part of the coast. Nearer somehow. And there's that cold again. Always the cold. Reach for the trap. Nothing but locusts in this trap as well. Definitely no cryptozoological monstrosity. Empty as all of them. One more of these and we're done. <laughs> he pants, and his face is red from the cold sea air. He crouches to catch his breath. You getting tired? No, no, I'm fine. I didn't mean to complain, it's just... He's short-winded. The sentence ends there. All right. Go check this last one. Always skeptic, Kim. Sometimes you just have to believe. Uh, it's up this way. That's to land's end. We have to go this way. Come on. All right, back where we started. This is the last of the traps. The one Morel just set. Checking it over, he said, is just a technicality. Look around. The reeds by the abandoned campsite hiss and shake in the lazily falling rain. The later it gets, the colder. Remnants of the camp can still be seen in the sand. The fire that's gone out. You feel strange, somehow. It keeps mentioning the cold. I wonder if that affects finding the, uh, the phasmid or not. I reach for the trap. The trap feels light and silent as you pick it up. Something is different here. Look closer. No locus. No phasmid either, but still. Look closer still. Well, the bait worked on something. This doesn't mean it was a reed monster, though. Unless you see one in there, I just see an empty trap. Lieutenant studies the trap with you. 
The netting is a little untidy, messier than the others. Like someone or something picked the trap up and shook it before dropping it back down on the ground. Yeah, but what if it was the Phasmid? What if it ate them and got out? Right. Anyway, that's for the cryptozoologist to figure out now. We are not cryptozoologists. We are cops. It does not look like he thinks you're right. Then he adds for clarity. A cold gust of air dries your sweaty face, and you look to the dark shadow, the felled building in the distance, drawing you to it. What a strange sensation. Once this is done, should you try to ask again? You've checked all the traps now. There's nothing else to do with them. The cryptozoologists await your report. I feel like maybe there's a skill check that I failed here. I wonder if it's perception. We have a lot of perception, don't we? Uh, four. It's not great. But it could have been a different skill check sometimes. You use ones I don't think you necessarily think that you would use in a situation. I said yeah, I could ask again after the uh, the failed building, so maybe we can go back there and and find it. Check one thing real fast. What do we have? Do we not pass that composure check with Renee? Let's do that real fast. Like playing in the dark. Sharpens your nocturnal instincts. Feels like being on recon again. Oh. Do Maybells mean anything to you, Rene? Show him the flower. I prefer the old name. Insulindian Lily. Girls brought them to young cadets when they entered service. Wearing them on your cap was supposed to bring good luck. He glances at it and frowns. Hold on. Is this a royalist military tradition? It used to be. But the communards were fond of them too. Call them revolutionary flowers. Bells of the revolution. He says with a sigh. Did they bring you good luck? You know what? No. They brought me misery. False hope. And disappointment. The revolutionary sullied them. He falls silent. An emerging smile withdraws. But... It wasn't the revolutionaries that sullied the ID for you, was it? She gave them to me too, and your jealous little heart just couldn't accept it. He looks at the old soldier almost gently. Enough! I can go over these matters in detail with you, Gaston, but not while we have company. So, officers. He cuts in sharply. Mabel's don't blossom yet, do they? Lieutenant quickly asks. Maybe on some remote parts of the city they do. Uh, but I think you'll have to wait for at least a month. The old carabineer shrugs. I understand Jeanne Marie meant a lot to you. There's nothing for you to understand here. It is not her death you are investigating. He snaps. Where was the photo of you two taken? Revachal Fair of 91 in the Forberg district. A parade was held to honor Guillaume Lillian's name day. And the Carabineers marched in the place of honor. His eyes turned to the sea. He looked happy in the picture, smiling. This was the happiest day of my life. This is said in, a, in such a matter of fact tone, it leaves no room for doubt. Were the circumstances of her death in any way or any sense unusual? Absolutely not. 
She died of pneumonia in her bed at the age of 79. This is highly usual. His voice is coarse. What happened with you, Gaston and Jeanne Marie? I was 22 when I returned from King Guillaume's Akira operation in the south and found my sweetheart in the arms of this wretch. The Akira operation was a seven year campaign during which suzerain Guillaume's army forcefully united the people in the southeastern part of La Petite Continent, collectively known as the Aikiela tribes under the River Cholian banner. I won her back, but while I was dealing with some issues... He gives Gaston a hateful look. You were like a dark cloud sucking the joy out of every living thing around you. And you... you... Hurt her. He quickly glances at you. Dark cloud. That sounds unpleasantly familiar. I, uh, I. He looks down at his boots, lips moving, but the words are inaudible. Those days and memories are gone. He nods and looks Renee with something resembling compassion. The old soldier says nothing, but when his glance quickly runs over Gaston's face, there's an odd look in his eyes. What is it about this old soldier that makes him stand so proud? Still, all you see is an old soldier refusing to reply. Anything else I can assist you with, officer? We still have a game to finish. Just one moment, where is composure? Oh, I can't put any more points into it. Ah, of course not. I think I have better equipment to, than I could have... Oh, uh, well. Shoot. <laughs> one of these days I'll get that. Just not to, well, let's see if Gaston has anything to say about what we just talked about. I suspect he doesn't. It is such a pleasure. Yeah. All right, to the cryptozoologists. Who's that guy? Yeah, I'll see Gary here. Let's talk to Morel first. It's great to see you again, officer. My wife can't wait to thank you. Go on, talk to her. He grins, bowing awkwardly. Oh, sweetie, I don't even know how to thank you for finding my husband and helping him out. I hope we haven't been too much trouble for you. She says, beaming. I just do my job, ma'am. Here, I want to give you a small token of my gratitude. It's a tie. Mesk in origin. The pin is an antique. Quite special. She hands you a thin ribbon held together by a silver bird skull. Eight-eyed terratorn tie. The little silvery knob holding the tie together feels warm in your hand. It's in the shape of an avian skull with eight eyes. You could ask her about this when you get the time. It's probably a cryptid, but the phasmid, of course, is more important. You never told me you've seen the phasmid. Oh, you don't want to hear about some old woman's ramblings. Ramblings? Nonsense. Your description of the phasmid is the most precise I've ever heard. Darling, I didn't even get the size of it right. You were a child, my dear. Really. It's extraordinary what you were able to describe. Now go on. Tell our friend about it. He's proven his interest in the field. Reflexively, the lieutenant read his, his familiar notebook. Well, it was summer. I was building a racing track out of sand on the beach near a tall stand of reeds quite a tall one many times my height I remember when all of a sudden she starts wait where was this and how old were you ah I'm getting ahead of myself I was five and a half in Betancourt in the suburbs my grandmother had a summer home there she'd just started forming memories real memories 
not the billowy haze of infanthood. Beton Court got bombed in the war. It used to be quite near, circa 20 kilometers from here. What happened? The strangest moment of my life. I looked up and one of the reeds moved. Not like a plant, but like a living thing. It stood up and looked at me. Its body unfolded like some antique toy. I've never seen anything like it. I didn't know this can happen, so I reached my arm and touched the thing. It felt just like a stalk of reed, but it moved, swaying, towering above me. After a while, 20 seconds, a minute maybe, it left, went into the reeds. Did he follow it? I tried, but I was only a child. There was mud and high water. I couldn't see it anymore. I was just standing there, knee deep in mud, looking around me. Where did you go? Don't go. Then what? I ran back home to my grandmother and asked her if reeds could walk and told her they were looking at me. <laughs> of course, she just laughed at me, but I knew what I'd seen. She chuckles. For years, it was a story I told at parties when I wanted to impress boys, that sort of thing. Of course, most people just took it as a strange, amusing anecdote. So did I, honestly. But then I met Morel. She brushes her hair back. We were on a date. Can you imagine? She tells me a story, and it's the most detailed report of the Insulindian phasmid I've ever heard. The sounds. She told me it hissed. It did, yes. Like reeds in a gust of wind. The way it moved, the colour. How some of its limbs were white, like marble. It matched perfectly with what I know from other accounts. It was amazing. He breathes excitedly. If it weren't for Lena, I might have given up hope years ago. It's no exaggeration to say that she restored my faith in my profession. He looks at her with admiration, forgetting a wild, wide smile on his face. You were on a date. Our first, yes. The old woman looks at her husband tenderly. The glance is tender, yes, but tempered by something else. A thought she can't express, even to him. Interesting. Its limbs are white. Not all of them. There is some white coloration reported, along with beige, where the camouflage ends. He answers for her. How big was it? It's hard to say how big things are when you're quite small yourself. To me, it seemed to be taller than I was then, but that's probably not the case. Maybe you imagined it, Lena. How could she? Who imagines this? She didn't know about the phasmid. This is the main thing here, what makes it a confirmed sighting. She had no previous knowledge of the insect. So she couldn't have made it up. Or imagined it. That's true, yes. I'm almost certain neither my mother nor my grandmother knew of it. It was only when I started telling my story as a teenager that boys would tell me, Lena. She lowers her voice, imitating a boy. You trying to tell us you saw the insul Indian fastmid out there in those reeds? Get out of here. <laughs> they just give me a cider and ruffle my hair and tell me to stop dreaming, but I saw it. She smiles. Kim, what do you think of this? I thought it was a wonderful story, man. He closes his notes and gives her a simple smile. Well, thank you for sharing this with me. You're welcome, sweetie. I do appreciate the chance to relive it whenever I get one. It was just... <sighs> such an impossibly sunshiny day. So warm. She sighs. Exactly. I can't mention how cold it was on the coast. It has to be warm out. I guarantee it. And she could get up and walk right into the reeds on her own. Into the mud. Anywhere. Now maybe you could convince her to tell you about some cool cryptids. There's really no point in manipulating anyone. She'd be only too pleased to tell you about her work. Go on and ask. Well, earlier she turned me down. Hey, Lena. I'd like to hear about some of the cryptids you've studied. Can you just tell me about a couple of them? Oh, I'd be delighted. Truth be told, I could really use the company too. One cryptid. 
Not a couple. One. This won't turn into some kind of cryptid extravaganza. The lieutenant throws you one of one of his looks. Cryptid extravaganza. I like the sound of that. And I don't. Just one. <laughs> or he'll be disappointed in you. Ooh, tough choice there. Is this bird a cryptid? Point to the tie she gave you. No. It's the cryptid. Your eyes narrow mysteriously. Wow, the cryptid. Oh, yes. The small silvery skull shines between your fingers, its beak sharp. Okay, what is this bird? The eight-eyed teratorn, the largest flying avian ever discovered with a wingspan of 11.5 meters. It was thought to have gone extinct 3,500 years ago. Some even doubted the fossils were real. A mutation, they said. Until... Mutation? <laughs> All of evolution is a mutation. Until? Until it was sighted by renowned Gottwaldian explorer and naturalist Uwe Plattenkalk in 21. This renown seems a bit dubious. Your own catalogue comes up completely empty. But, of course, you are not all-knowing. I need to hear about this sighting. It happened on a botanical expedition into the vast and unexplored Oambrau Canyon in southeast Ilmara. Dr. Plattenkalk got separated from his group during a sandstorm. Okay, and Oambrau is... The world's largest canyon system, sweetie. It's a barren waste east of the Erg Desert. An ancient riverbed completely dried up. What happened? Alone in the blasted desert heat, the doctor wandered eastward, where man hasn't stepped foot in over a thousand years since the fall of Pericarnassus. He was lost without any navigation equipment and desperately low on water. After a day or two, he noticed a bird high in the noon sky. A great black bird, it seemed gargantuan. Every now and then, the bird would dive down to feed on an animal carcass somewhere on the horizon. But by the time Uva got there, the Teratorn had taken off already, and the carcass was picked clean. This happened many times. He was following it. Yes, or rather, hunting. A bird that big has a lot of blood in it, and he was dying of thirst. For many days, Dr. Plottenkalk followed the Teratorn until they reached a great canyon wall where the bird finally landed to rest. The professor climbed up there with a rock in his hand. He found the bird sleeping with his head tucked under its wing, a great black pile of feathers on the perch. So he approached, slowly squeezing the rock in his fist. Then the Teratorn suddenly looked at him. He could see it had eight eyes, four on either side of its skull, like a spider. And the man couldn't move. He was paralyzed, frozen into place with the rock in his hand. Whatever he did, he could not get closer to the bird. Why? The bird was controlling his mind. It kept him from approaching. He could step back. Every time he stepped forward, paralysis. Uva spent three days trying until the bird flew away. Hold on. How did he survive to tell the story? The eight-eyed Teratorn was indifferent to him, as long as he didn't get closer than two steps. It even let him feed on some carcasses up there and the two unfertilized eggs it left behind. An eight-eyed mind-controlling bird. Heck yes. Absolutely, sweetie. Cryptozoologists have been tracing it ever since, but Wamrao is vast, mysterious, and holds many secrets. She smiles. Glad you agree. Modern radar telemetry shows great promise. We will confirm this one by the end of the decade, latest. This one I liked. Not only does it have eight eyes and is a living fossil, and the largest bird ever to live. It also does mind control. <laughs> Lieutenant puts down his notes. So that was the last anyone saw of it. Sadly, yes. 
but there are numerous reports of eight-eyed bird skulls from Il Mara. And then there's the striking resemblance to the Periconassian Imperial Eagle, an ancient heraldic symbol that is hard to pass off as coincidence. The Imperial Eagle, too, had eight eyes. Not really. It's just stylization. The way they drew eyes. It's not a zoological drawing. Very, very hard. This one's very famous. Everyone knows it. People will be looking at that tie on you and thinking, that man is into cryptids. <laughs> so, what else do you want to know? As uh, she winks. Uh, this has been educational. Sadly, we need to discuss something else. Of course, dear. Alright, that's all for now, ma'am. Let's do this first. Fate of birth generator. You were born in the year 07. In the last year of the commune of Revachon, right before it fell in the old military hospital on the ground floor, where people usually came to die during a snowstorm. The revolution had about one year left to go, and the fires were still burning bright. There were explosions in the blizzard. This was 44 years ago. You are 44 years old. The bloating might never leave your face, but beneath it, you still have some years. You still have some hope. So learning cap for logic raised to four and minus one difficulty to all physique passives. That's pretty good. Don't run across a lot of physique checks, I think, but uh. Not bad. All right, and then she gave us some clothes. Eight eye Territorn tie. So plus one inland empire, octuple vision, and then plus one to volition, cryptids protection. A slender bolo tie held together by an antique clasp in the shape of a bird skull. The skull features eight cavities for eyes. It's disturbing, but you can't look away. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. Ha <laughs> ha! Nothing like the gratitude of a good woman. Now then, what can I do for you? He gives you a gruff pat on the shoulder. He tries to play it cool, remain professorial. But inside, this man is itching for some news on those traps. So I checked all the traps. Good. Okay. And? He breaks his calm. And one of them was empty. Completely empty? The cryptozoologist's eyes grow wide. Yes, there's nothing in the trap. No locusts, no phasmid. No locusts? No phasmid either? That's not ideal, but... He rubs his chin. The empty trap was the one at your campsite. Maybe this factors into it somehow. I definitely left that one stocked. Hmm. Right from the campsite? Just means the Insul Indian Phasmid is even more clever than we thought. The old woman's face lights up. Of course, more clever. The detective whispers to himself. Yes, the Phantasmodea picked off the locust and escaped. This is good news, though we'll have to reconsider the design of the traps, make them more secure. Another trip to the reeds. Where is, is that, is that the guy that's standing over here? Doesn't look like him. His companion sighs. Uh, yes, that's exactly what it is. What a deft hunter, this phasmid. Of course, be sarcastic. Unless you have an alternative hypothesis you'd like to venture. Mine stands, okay? He misinterprets your words. Actually, no. Excuse me for getting emotional. This is a big deal for us. You've helped us twice now. And brought some great news too. My gratitude and the gratitude of the Societe Cryptozoologique de Ravachol is yours. His tone changes. Heartfelt gratitude. But does it feel like closure? What really happened? Thank you, it's an honor. We should probably return to our main investigation here. This has been refreshing, but... 
He says with a straight face, then turns to you. I develop an alternative theory about the missing locusts. Consider the way the empty trap was disturbed, as though shaken. Most likely the hands of a young person. Hands small enough to fit inside the trap, too. You should ask the red-headed boy, Kuno. I think a little hooligan called Kuno may have stolen the locusts. A little hooligan? But what would a child want with bags? Oh my dear Morel, you've been an old man for too long. Kids love to torment insects almost as much as they love to torment old folks. A shadow of worry passes over the woman's face. I'll talk to the little gremlin and see if anything comes up. Delinquents, my favorite. It doesn't sound like it's really his favorite. Oh, you've been such a dear to us. Please let us know whatever you turn up. I have a feeling we're getting so close. So we're not done looking for the phasmid yet. That's exciting. Well, I see you've got all the help you need. I'll see you tonight at my place. Let's play suzerainty, but no more field trips for me. The man turns to his companions. He hasn't been particularly forthcoming before. He may well still be hiding something. After he's left, it's too late. Really, Gary? We're getting somewhere here. I'd love to play suzerain tea, but... The woman's voice is a little, sh a little shaky suddenly. Lena, I'm sorry, but you're not getting anywhere. It was some kids. I know the little mutants around here. Leave anything out in the open and they'll steal it, even if it's bugs. He looks at his tea. Morel, it's been fun, really. But I need a bath and I have deliveries to handle. When this tea is done, I gotta run. No, no, no need to apologize, Geary. You'd be more than helpful. We'll have to take a rain check on that game of Sue's rain tea today, though. We're gonna follow this through. He keeps the language unemotional. But it's in there. Disappointment. Is this Gary? Doesn't look like him. This guy's got white hair. Uh, do I have this? Hi again, Gendarme. No, not yet. Bye -bye, I can't Gendarme. put any more points into it. Um, I'm gonna assume this is Gary then. I can try and talk to him after, uh, or in the next one. I'm gonna call it here. Uh, next episode, we'll probably continue talking to Lena about crypto or cryptids, and then, uh, we'll talk to this guy. This might be Gary? It doesn't look anything like his portrait or like the guy that was standing out there, so I don't know. But they're making it seem like this is my last opportunity to talk to him, so I'm gonna assume that's Gary. We'll try to talk to him. If not, then I don't know where he's at in here. But yeah, that really just doesn't look like him. I don't know. Either way, gonna call it here. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you guys in the next one.